Welcome to the Remembering a Life podcast. I'm your host, Holly Ignatowski, and today we're talking with Dr. Joseph Stern, a board-certified neurosurgeon and author. In 2015, Dr. Stern lost his sister to a nearly year-long battle with leukemia. Through this loss, his encounters with medical professionals, and his own experience as a neurosurgeon, Dr. Stern realized the need of integrating compassion and empathy into the medical field. He has since become committed to deepening and humanizing the doctor-patient relationship. He is the author of Grief Connects Us, a neurosurgeon's lessons on love, loss, and compassion. Later in the episode, I'll share how you can win a copy. Welcome, Dr. Stern, and thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you, Holly. It's a great privilege. In your book, Dr. Stern, you tell the story of your sister, Victoria, and about her experiences being treated for leukemia. And you also describe how you, as a brother and a doctor, accompanied her on this journey. Tell us a little bit about your sister, and please share what that experience was like for you. Uh, my sister, Victoria, was a spitfire. She was an actress, a mother. Um, she was full of life and full of passion. When she got sick, she wasn't expecting it at all. And she started by writing a journal. She said she wanted to write a journal uh, to write a one-woman show on surviving leukemia. And so the book actually started with her journal. Unfortunately, she didn't live through uh, her experience, but I realized in her journal was were kind of uh, the core of what it's like to go through a mortal illness, and I wanted to honor her memory by sharing that with the world. And that's why you included your sister's journal entries into your book as well. Why was it important that you included her own voice in that book? Uh, I was trying to grapple with my own um, experience of loss and what it's like to lose someone you love dearly and also wrestling with uh, what kind of was a transformation for me from going from a physician who was taught to be detached and objective to realizing that you have to be emotionally connected and present. And my sister's voice rang true and, and reoriented me into what it was like for her to be ill and to go through that experience. And I think it helps the reader to understand what it's like to have uh, such an illness. At one point, you spent two weeks with your sister while she was sick because you lived in different cities. And during that time, you wrote her a letter after you had spent the two weeks saying, uh, quote, spending these two weeks with you has been a delight for me. I have grown as well, and I thank you for that. I'll be able to bring some of these realizations to other areas of my life, and this will be helpful on many levels. How did your experience with your sister's illness and death reshape your role as a neurosurgeon and possibly how you communicate with your patients now? Well, when my sister got sick, we had been apart for many years. She had started her own family. I had started mine. I lived in, in North Carolina. She lived in uh, California. And so we didn't have that much to do with each other. And I always felt sort of guilty, like I hadn't really been there for her. And then when she got sick, she reached out and said, you know, I, I really need your help. And initially, I was trying to juggle working full time as a neurosurgeon and trying to be available for her. And I realized I couldn't do it. And so I just stopped and went, uh, flew to uh, Los Angeles and stayed with her in, in Santa Monica. And what was so nice was I was initially afraid. And I remember when I entered her hospital room, I really wasn't sure, you know, would it work? Would it be okay? And it just felt so refreshing and uh, really a relief to be able to, to reconnect with her. Uh, and I realized that in the process of kind of recognizing the importance of compassion and connection with patients that you need to really be present and be available and be honest and uh, uh, connect on an emotional level with patients, which is kind of relearning how I practice and how I uh, different from how I trained. I always was, I was trained that you always had to be kind of reserved, distant, uh, emotionally not connected, you know, be available, uh, sort of apply compassion, and but not really as a truly meaningful connection with patients. And I've, I've sort of been trying to relearn that whole way of doing things. I now, instead of using distance, I now use something called emotional agility, where I'm able to flex between being uh, detached enough to do surgery, but at the same time connected and 
open enough to be able to really have a meaningful uh, relationship with the patient. So she, she really changed, changed me a lot in that whole process. Along those lines, most of us, we can't imagine what it's like to have to balance that compassion with that emotional separation necessary for you to do your job. How do you find that balance between the two, and has that changed for you since your sister's death? Well, that, that's really one of the big purposes of my book, is trying to uh, take people on that journey, the journey that I went on, because initially I found it very, very difficult. If you open yourself up to emotional connection with patients, it's very difficult to put the lid back on that, and I didn't really know how to, how to flex between those things. But I think it is possible to learn that. I also think in medical school and in medical training and residency, we really don't give any attention to training practitioners how to be emotionally present and connected and available and at the same time be able to function well in your job. I recognize that if you try to create distance, it really doesn't protect you from the grief. It doesn't really push that away. It just pushes it back into the recesses of your mind. But unless you actually go through these emotions such as grief and sadness and really experience them, you you become um, uh, sort of a prisoner of those. That It's difficult to to get rid of them. You can't get rid of them by suppressing them. And so I realized the only way to really live fully and richly with meaningful relationships with patients is to is to experience those things. And so that was a real kind of uh, reset for me. When I look back now from where I am at the present time, I realize that that's really the essential way to, to be able to practice and have have a, uh, a meaningful, uh, satisfying practice as, as a doctor. In your book, you mentioned that you often send a note to the caregiver after losing a patient. Is this part of your grief process after the death of one of your patients? I think it's important to really to acknowledge people and, and their suffering and their sadness. And um, there's a lot of sorrow. And if you don't express that or you don't um, connect with people, you, you don't really, you're not able to really fulfill that relationship. So, yes, I think it's very important. It's important for me. It's also important for them. As you said, how can the medical profession and medical schools better prepare new professionals for understanding how the grief not only affects the patient and the family and friends of the patient, but also them as medical professionals themselves? What can be done to teach that? So first of all, I, I think uh, there's no direct training on going through grief and what that experience entails and allowing uh, students to recognize that these are normal things that you really have to go through and experience and, and welcoming that rather than trying to just limit it or push it away. So I think that's really one of the important things. And I also think that with that comes a different mindset, moving away from detachment and distance uh, towards compassion and empathy and emotional agility. So I think there's really a need to have some directed training in these specific areas, no matter what area of medicine you're in. And I find it difficult. I've been uh, doing this to a limited degree in medical schools, but sometimes when I try to, I talk to one uh, professor and I said, you know, I really think you need to include this in your curriculum. And she said, well, we just don't have time. We have so many other things we have to we have to emphasize. And I said, I think you have to make time. This is like one of the most fundamental parts of education that's not being addressed. So until we do address that, we're not going to get empathetic, compassionate, connected physicians. Uh, and if you don't train people how to do it, you shouldn't wait till someone goes through a, a mid-profession crisis to learn it themselves. This is something that you need to provide the tools and the training so people can adjust as they go through life. Uh, with some guidance. And on the flip side of that, is it helpful for us as patients to understand why many medical professionals don't always express a lot of emotion when they consult with us? We think, oh, they're mean, cold people. But is it important for patients to understand that doctors maybe do need a little bit of that distance? I think they do, but I also think that patients probably need to drive this conversation. I think it's okay for a patient to really expect or feel a need for that compassionate connection with a practitioner. And if you find yourself with a doctor who's cold and distant or treats you as an object, then, you know, a lot of times the old 
style would be just, well, that's the way they are. They don't have a really good bedside manner. I'm, my position is that a bedside manner is really a key part of your relationship with that physician. And if you don't find it, then you might want to try uh, working with somebody different. So I think that we, it's, it's reasonable for us to expect this from our physician. Dr. Stern, do you feel that as a society we need to perhaps better embrace death? We spend so much of our time and resources on preserving life, and as a doctor, that's what you do on a daily basis. Are we doing ourselves and our families a disservice? I know that your sister was incredibly strong and, and didn't want to even entertain the possibility that she might not make it through this illness, but you perhaps felt that there was a missed opportunity for goodbyes. Do we need to embrace death in our society? Absolutely. I mean, if you think about it, no one, uh, no one has survived. You know, we all die. So we take something that is inevitable and shroud it in... Um, disconnected behaviors. You know, when my sister was initially diagnosed, she was given, uh, she had a 6% five-year survival rate for her type of leukemia, but nobody was willing to discuss that. She didn't want to hear that, and I understand that. But then when, when her bone marrow transplant, she relapsed very early after her bone marrow transplant, and essentially that was a death sentence for her. And the physicians just gave her different kinds of chemotherapy to kind of uh, tread water, but no one really took the time and sat down and acknowledged that actually this this wasn't going to end well. They really were they were running out of opportunities, and she never addressed with her children and with her husband that you know this was likely to happen. So when she died, they were completely shocked and totally taken uh, by surprise for this. And I think that was a terrible missed opportunity uh, that, that no one ever had a chance to say goodbye. Nobody had a chance to really talk about how meaningful their connection and their relationships were. And, uh, you know, then a year and a half later, after my sister died, her husband, Pat, had a ruptured brain aneurysm and lapsed into a coma. And their, their son, who had been the bone marrow donor for his mother ended up doing CPR on his father. And so a year and a half later, they went through this all over again. And then at that point, I was the healthcare power of attorney for her husband. And we had to make decisions about withdrawing treatment and letting him die. And so this that was one of the other things that sort of drove me in this book was these two wrenching experiences. And I realized there again, we needed to have palliative care more involved more early and be able to talk about death and dying and be able to have advanced directives so that all these things weren't a matter of surprise. That's a lot for one family to have to go through. How are your nephews doing now? Well, they both are gone to college. One is about to uh, graduate and the other is in the middle of his college experience. And I think it's they're doing well, but it's been a very tough road for them, I think. Your life's work is very demanding and stressful. How do you care for yourself so that you can continue to care for your patients and their families as well? Where, where does your care come from? Well, I think that you're hitting on a very important topic, which is you know, self-compassion. I think if you look at a lot of physicians, particularly neurosurgeons, we tend to be perfectionistic and highly self-critical. We're very demanding. And the thing is, if you, if you don't accept your fallibility and your, you know, that we're always... I'm, I make errors. I've never done a perfect surgery. You know, I've always wanted, that's my goal. But I have um, aspirations that I try to achieve, but I can't. And uh, I always strive for that. But you have to be able to find a balance where you are forgiving of yourself, accepting of your failures and uh, frailty, and then also finding pleasure in your life. And one of the things that's sort of the silver lining for this, and one of the reasons, that, again, for the book is with this emotional agility, if you create this boundary and distance from your emotional self, you know, uh, through being distant with patients and with these experiences. The problem I realized was the emotional armor is not something you can put on or take off. It's there all the time. And it sort of, it, it, it causes uh, you to have a dulling of your own meaningful relationships outside of work. So getting rid of that emotional armor and allowing uh, more deep experiences has, for me, been uh, its own reward. And so I feel that that has allowed me to have a, a richer and fuller life. But the thing is, 
You have to. Uh, I've learned a lot of new things. I'm always kind of looking for new ways of doing things, new ways of thinking. And uh, I think the emotional agility piece has been a huge uh, improvement for me. I've been doing mindfulness and meditation, and I've been, uh, I do a lot of exercise, do a lot of reading. And the writing has itself been a way for me to uh, find meaning in what I do. My family is very important to me as well, and, and spending time with them. Wonderful. On your LinkedIn profile, you list brain tumors and deep brain stimulation among your skills, but you also list compassion. Why is it important for you to list compassion as part of your skill set? I think that we are at a time, both in our society and in uh, medical systems, where the compassion is getting squeezed out. And I think that that's really a huge mistake. In order to be an effective doctor, I think compassion is one of the core uh, requirements. And I have found that patients crave this. Uh, my One of the things I, I tell people is that if you actually really focus on that, uh, on a meaningful connection with patients and families, you will be overwhelmed by patients, by the number of people who want you to care for them, because there's so little of this. And so many times, physicians, uh, instead of having a meaningful, connected, emotionally integrated relationship, they, they tend to have more transactional relationships where they are doing procedures, but not connecting with a person. And I think that's a recipe for bad medical care, for unhappy patients, for poor communication. And to me, the compassion part is is one of the core things that allows me to function well and to, to be an effective doctor. I think that, you know, we tend to focus on the skills, the technical skills, and they're important, but I feel like the human skills are every bit as important. And if you look at uh, patients' reactions to their medical care, when they don't find compassion in the care, it generally means that they had a bad experience. And when they do find their physicians to be compassionate, it's usually met with a great uh, that it's a successful relationship, even if the outcome is that the person dies, you know, because we can't solve all problems. We can't cure all illness. So we have to be along for the journey. I understand you've also participated in missions to Honduras, where you've performed free spinal surgeries through a program sponsored by One World Surgery, which they provide surgical care in Honduras and other countries that lack access to these services. How has this particular volunteer work further shaped your work with your patients back home? So one of the things I think is that has been a bit difficult for me or that I'm sorting my way through is that if you believe that compassion is the core value of, of your mission as a physician, you start finding it difficult if you are working in systems, health systems, or working with insurance companies or various other entities that lack compassion. And one of the things that's been great is to associate myself with an organization that has as its core value compassionate care. And when I go there, we have limited resources and limited supplies, and yet everybody who's there is there because they want to be and they've chosen to be, and they are making the best out of difficult situations. So I sometimes go there and I get I get energized because I see what a difference we can make and how we can totally change people's lives and how rewarding that is. And it feels like a can-do situation. And when I come back, I sometimes find myself frustrated because we have way more supplies and way more equipment, but an awful lot of uh, barriers to care and a lot of people saying, well, these are the reasons you can't do something. So you go from can do to can't do. Uh, it's, it's kind of frustrating because I look and I say, there are so many things that we can do and different ways that we can function, different systems that we can create and, and thrive if we have a can do cooperative uh, culture and a uh, working relationship between all the various entities, you know, the, the nurses, the physicians, the surgeons, the scrub techs. In, in, in back home, there's a lot of silos, and people are very concerned about their turf and about their uh, status, and there's too many barriers to effective uh, cooperative communication and care. 
And I think patients suffer. And I think the practitioners who are in those uh, situations, it becomes quite frustrating. I ask all my guests on the podcast who they are remembering today, and I think I know your answer. Can you, would you like to share a fond memory of your sister with us today, Dr. Stern? Um, <laughs> there are many. I mean, I I, uh, <laughs> I think of her, My so my sister was, I'm more introverted and kind of um, more private, and she's always, uh, she was always, nothing slowed her down. She wouldn't, she wouldn't back down from a fight, she would she would uh, tackle any challenge. I remember we went to, we were kids, and we went to a, um, a Paul McCartney concert, and she, we afterwards, we wanted to get autographs, and we were kids then, and I was very shy, and I wouldn't do this, and she just went right up to the people and said, you know, find my, find my poster, <laughs> and I just, I do miss that, um, that energy and that uh, lust for life, and the, and her, Willingness to meet any challenge head on. You know, when I, when I, as a, as a doctor, I don't have to try out. And when she was an actress, you know, she tried out over and over and over again, meeting rejection time after time after time. And every time she just, you know, brushed herself up, got right back up, went and tried out again. And I just admired that willingness to face adversity and to accept uh, rejection and just get back in there. She sounds wonderful, and I really enjoyed getting to know her through your book as well. So thank you for sharing that and her. And um, I hope that all of my doctors read your book. I would love that. I really I really do think we can do better. And the thing is, if we do better for our patients, we do better for ourselves as well. Thank you for joining me today, Dr. Stern. And thank you for sharing your sister Victoria's story with us and how that experience has helped make you more thoughtful, meaningful, and compassionate uh, with your own patients. And I know your book will be an inspiration to many people. I'm, I'm delighted to share it with you, and I'm, I'm delighted to share my sister with the world. And thank you all for listening today. To enter to win a copy of Dr. Stern's book, Grief Connects Us, Visit rememberingalife.com slash giveaways.